Hello once again and welcome to Otto's Garage. Okay, it's time to have a look at that crankshaft and see if we can get that back in the block with some new shells. Uh, the first thing we've got to do though is just double check that the uh, sizes are within torrances on that crank. So I'll uh, just have a quick look at those now. Uh, the information is available um, through the uh, various suppliers. Um, AE Car have got a fantastic website there with a lot of technical information. You can download all of the um, uh, Delta uh, um, and Prisma as well information uh, free of charge. So we've had a good look at that and um, we're going to have a, a check with the caliper gauge on those bearings uh, and just check that everything's okay before we actually drop the new shells in. So looking at the crank itself, um, what I've done is I've, I've gone over with the vernier gauge basically and just, just checked the, um, the main uh, bearings uh, and also obviously the, the, the big ends as well, the bottom of the crankshaft there. Um, sorry, the bottom of the conrod where the, where the piston mounts on. So um, really good, everything is well within tolerance and it is all standard as well, so it's not being messed around with. Uh, I did know that before I ordered the shells, but I've just given it a double check as well. So what we can do now is um, get them shells dropped in to the bottom of the block and then we can um, position the crank on top of it. So these are the shells that I've got, um, basically the standard, you can get them different thicknesses uh, depending on whether the crank has had a grind on it, but we know that it's standard so happy days. So we'll, uh, we'll get and position those in um, and then we can see where we are. Now the other thing that we do need to do, because the engine is going to stand for a while, we've got this super sticky kind of assembly lube really. Um, which basically means that when the engine is fired up for the first time it's not going to have any metal on metal, it will have a, a film there. And I'm reliably informed by um, Tim from uh, Tim Adams Race Engines um, that uh, you could probably run the engine for an hour without, uh, without any oil on it, so uh, not, we're not going to do that, but it's obviously a very good product there. So, let's get on with it. That's the block. Um, I've just popped this one in here. So basically that's the shell. It's got a little tag on one end of it. That corresponds to a position on the uh, casting. And basically you can't really go wrong. You can only go in one way. And you just give it a little push down. Bingo, in she is. Um, what I did do before all of this, I blew out all of the oilways and I've checked all of these are nice and clean and clear, a lot of air coming out of those. Um, it's got a very light covering of oil on that but um, there's no moving part obviously between the shell and the casting. You know, so, um, and obviously oil is going to come through there and that's what all these holes are for so that feeds into the bearing around the crank. So I'm going to get all those other ones popped in there and then we can actually um, drop the crank on top. And there they are, that's the shells in there. Uh, so the middle bearing has got this wider one on it with no groove and there's a corresponding shell that goes on the top for the cap as well. And that's cool. Um, what I have done as well is with the assembly lube I've been able to stick the thrust washer in on each side of that so now I can drop the crank over the top of that and she should be good. There is a groove in the thrust washer you can see those two grooves there they need to go against the bearing face of the crank so basically oil will now find its way in between the thrust washer and the surface of the crank. And there it is right I've just dropped that down on there and uh, got a nice bit of free free movement on there. So the next step really is to get the uh, main caps and then we can um, put the other half of the bearing in those and then we can get those positioned over the top. I've just trial fitted the, um, the mains caps on there um, and if you have a look at them they've got little grooves in which correspond to the position that they should be in. Um, now 
it does help to take pictures when you take the engine apart so I've been able to just clarify that that's right so what what it says in the manual and what I've got there thankfully are the correct way around but what I've got to do now is just put some more lubrication on underneath there and then we can drop those on and get them bolted in place so they don't fall out at the moment right so the uh, mains cap bolts uh, we're going to use a bit of assembly lubricant on that and um, we just need to put a bit on the thread and a bit just under the head there uh, these two long ones they go onto the center bolt but uh, sorry the center cap but I mean you can't really go wrong it'll only go one way if you drop a short one and it just doesn't re reach the thread so there's obviously a lot deeper thread on those two center ones and the others are all the same anyway I've just given the polish off on the wheel uh, just to clean out all the threads and everything like that so uh, we'll get them lubed up and get them dropped in That's them in, so we're just uh, just tying those down, but not actually torque them immediately. And there we go. So that's the crank in. These just need torquing up, and then we're ready to rock. But uh, that's a nice step forward. Pistons. Okay. So. This is the piston with the old uh, rings in it. So we've got to take the old rings out and we're going to put new rings in. Right, so taking the rings out and you can see how clean that is underneath. Uh, and that's because it's been through the ultrasonic uh, cleaner. So if you haven't got an ultrasonic cleaner, you probably have to clean those grooves out and get them all nice and, uh, nice and clear. And obviously uh, making sure that the holes are clear as well for the oil control ring there. Right. Again, these are all standard size um, rings, so readily available. Happy days. And what we've got inside is three compartments, oil control ring, which comprises of three different elements. You put the springy bit in first, and then you put the bottom one in, and then the top one. Uh, and then basically uh, two compression rings on the top. So we start at the bottom, obviously, and work our way up. Dead simple procedure. So that's the oil control ring. So you've got the uh, kind of um, spring area, and then you get the two scrapers, which kind of sit one above and one below that. Right, and there you are. Um, plenty of videos on the internet on how to fit those, but we are going to need a ring compressor to get them down into the bores. The only thing you've got to mind is that um, you fit them the right way around because they've got like a sharp edge or a stepped edge on them. Um, not very clear on there, but basically it shows you their stepped edge and which one's the top and which one's the bottom. So that's to basically scrape the oil back down the uh, cylinder. Oh, right, okay, so um, got a little bit of a headache here going on, and it's not in my head, it's in my hand, and that is this puppy. So although we've got the rings on it, which is cool, everything fits, everything's nice, um, if you look at the top of it, you will see that that is not a turbo piston. Um, now it's just kind of come to light because I'm just looking at how they go in and I was always a bit dubious about this uh, Prisma Integrale having a turbo on it because I can't find anything anywhere that says it was manufactured that way and I'm guessing that our friend uh, at some stage who had it in the past has just basically whacked a turbo on it off the Delta and this would explain why I've been getting problems or they've had problems with it with overheating things like the exhaust trying to burn through the floor and stuff like that and we've got a bit of detonation marking on the top of the piston as well I think while I'm at this stage the only answer is I've got two routes to go down uh, changing the piston basically so it's either grabbing a set of second-hand um, turbo pistons which have got like a oval machine rather than having the two valve things it's just got one oval in the middle of it or we machine these which um, is an option we have got quite a bit of thickness on there we've just tested it with a ultrasonic thickness tester 
Uh, there's about 300 thou in there, so we have got a bit to play with. But one thing's for sure, I can't put these back in the car like they are because I think that's just going to lead to all sorts of problems. So that's a watch this space, I think, and go from there. Well, I've sorted out those pistons. Uh, shout out to Jim Taylor up at Chester there for getting me a set of secondhand turbo ones. So we're going to uh, take the old uh, two liter, i.e. normally aspirated ones off those um, conrods and we're going to put these turbo ones on. So here they are anyway. So these are a second hand set that we've had, um, but they are actually in better condition. But what I've got to do now, you can see that that deep dish in the top there which is basically giving us the lower compression that we're after so that should stop a lot of that pre-detonation that we've had um, or that the previous owner had I should say so I've got to take the um, the gudgeons out the middle there and then we'll get those into um, Tim's uh, parts washer and the ultrasound and get those cleaned up so I've just got to take these old rings off basically we've got new rings anyway so that's all cool so that's a job for tomorrow I think yeah happy days so in other news swirl pot Right, so we've got the tank at the back. We've got to find a way of getting the fuel up to the engine, obviously. Uh, and to avoid fuel starvation issues, you can fit a, a swirl pot. Now, these are quite clever now, because what we're doing is before you used to have a pot and then you have an extra pump and then a pump to supply the swirl pot. So you'd end up with two pumps and a whole load of boots. So what they're doing now is you basically get your Bosch 44 pump uh, this isn't actually a genuine one, but it's the same thing and that actually fits down in that hole there and Directly sucks from the bottom of the swirl pot So you get fuel pumped from the main tank into the pot out of the pump off to the engine So that is going to simplify a whole load of things You've also got a return from the engine and a return to the tank So you've basically got three fixings on there to, to connect up to so that will have to go in the boot. Happy days. Let's have a quick look and see where that swirl pot's going to end up. So the rear of the car in the boot, that's where all the fuel system action is going on. Uh, and there's our friend the swirl pot there. So basically what I've also got is a uh, Bosch Type 044 fuel pump. Um, replica it's not a genuine Bosch one but it's basically um, the same sort of thing and I'm just kind of laying gear out to see where it's going to go so we've basically got a feed down here on the bottom of the tank that's got to go through a filter which will be here somewhere and then it'll go into the 44 pump which will feed the swirl pot um, and we're going to use some um, some quite nice AN6 fittings um, anodized black and red and then we've got our um, fuel line as well so basically that'll feed into the swirl pot uh, from the swirl pot there'll be one of the outlets will come back and I think I'm going to run this up the top and across back down into the tank and then the other one here is going to be for the breather pipe so that'll, that'll have to have a one-way valve on that and breathe off somewhere uh, beyond that you've got the um, sender unit for the fuel gauge in the back there uh, and then on this side we've got the fuel filler which is going to be connected up to our in boot filler if you like so you won't see that until the boots open and then you can fill it with the boot open and then uh, out of the swirl pot we'll send a line down that way towards the front of the car to the engine and that's going to go through a filter which I've got in that box there I think I'll probably mount that on this um, bracket here which originally was for the spare wheel and then there'll be a line coming back obviously from all that which will go back into the swirl pot and then that will complete the loop so um, yeah all good stuff but I've got to get a couple more parts just get them laid out make sure it all's in the right place and then we can start cutting some fuel lines and getting it all fixed in 
one other thing that we're going to have a look at um, is basically putting a bar across the front of the tank. So I'm going to fix something from this arch right the way across to the other side over there, um, which will sit against the tank there. And then we can run a strap right, right round the back of the tank. And that's going to hopefully um, stop any forward movement, you know, in event of an impact. That tank at the moment uh, could move forward because we're not convinced about the strength of the straps. Um, and a big shout out to Phil Edwards on that one because he's um, built a number of rally cars and I think that's a very good idea. So I think we're going to be making up a bar that we can bolt in there uh, to get some extra location on the tank. Cheers, Phil. So balancing of the con rods, um, what I've done is I've just weighed the little ends and uh, had the big end supported on the bench uh, and it's just given me a weight of each little end um, and then what we've done is we've taken the lightest one which was 81 grams and we've just uh, taken a bit of material off the outside edge of the little end with the linishing disc on the grinder so what it means is that uh, we've just kind of just polished the outside edge of it there you can see uh, and that means that they are all now 81 grams so we are going to um, they're pretty good anyway that thing's just moving a little bit isn't it but it is it's give or take it's 81 grams but it just um, it just means now that those ones are all the same then it's so what we can do now is weigh the rod itself and we can see which one is the heaviest and then we could remove a little material off the big end and that should mean that they are all balanced the same. Weighing the total rod this one's considerably lighter so that's coming out at 789 um, and when we weigh the other ones that's got a 794 795 for that one and then the last one, 792. So what we need to do is just remove a bit of material off the back end of the um, the big end there. Um, and ideally you want to take it off somewhere kind of thick. So these corners here are quite thick. You know, they're not, it's not going to be detrimental just shaving the side of that off and the same over on this side here. So you've got four edges there you can go to. Don't really want to take anything off the bottom there. That's obviously a stressed area. Uh, certainly wouldn't be taking it off anywhere around here. So I think probably this idea is quite good. And then uh, we're going to try and get them all down to that first rod that we weighed. Um, so I'm going to make a note of these on the board so we can just see exactly what weight they are. And that was, yeah, 789. So uh, use a couple of grams off those other ones and we should be able to get them all balanced the same. And here we go. So you can see there where I've taken quite a bit off the side. Um, I did I did have a look at the bottom of it and I have taken a little bit off the very bottom there. It looks like they've at the factory in any event there's a um, a machine surface on there anyway. So I'm guessing that's where they do the balancing on that too. But we have had to take a considerable amount off because that piston connection rod there is bloody light at 788 compared to the others. Uh, this is now 788 as well. So those two are good. Uh, and I'm going to move on to these last two here. With the pistons, because uh, they're second hand, I've got no idea what came out of where. I've just had a look at them to see if there's any identification marks on them. And they have got a, what I'm guessing is a casting number uh, just, just here. And they are all different, which is good. So what I've done now is I've just labelled those up as being number one, two, three and four. And the casting numbers basically relate to that piston so when at least we weigh them and we take any material off we can then um, make sure they're in the right you know place basically um gudgeon pins one two three and four so i've just basically used those in that position there and we, what we'll do is we'll weigh the piston and the gudgeon pin together and then we've got a total mass of whatever the gudgeon pin is and the associated piston and then we just got to make sure we don't mix them all up Piston number four is coming in at 577, so I've just marked those up on the card up here. Um, and we can see there that uh, number one, we've got 578, 582, 
575 for number three and then like we said 577 for number four so basically what we need to do is get them down to 575 grams and you can see uh, number two is a heavy old bastard isn't it 582 god that needs to lose a couple of pounds right the other thing i've just had a look at is the non-gudgeon weighted piston so basically these weights here are the actual pistons themselves without the weight of the um, the gudgeon pin in it because obviously the gudgeon pin is quite a hefty bit of um, bit of material but what I don't want to do is just you know chop a whole rook out of the piston if um, if it's actually gudgeon that's causing the issue um, and you can see there that um, number two is still quite a weighty beast um, and it's uh, this foot number one's actually the lightest piston of 443 so uh, we've got a considerable difference there between those two but I do wonder whether I can cheat and take it out of the gudgeon pin which has probably got a bit more material to play with on the inside of the gudgeon pin obviously we can't do anything on the outside that's a bearing surface but we might be able to take a bit out of the inside of the gudgeon pin um, and then just see uh, whether we can get to the uh, balanced weight that way um, without taking huge amounts off the piston itself so uh, maybe a little bit off the piston and a little bit off the gudgeon is the way to go i don't know we'll have a look at that anyway well it's been a bit of a long uh, couple of weeks and i didn't quite get onto those pistons uh, in the time that i thought i was going to so um, what i'm going to do is come back to them in the next episode of otto's garage and uh, we'll see whether we manage to trim a bit of weight off them uh, in any event Hope you guys are all keeping safe and enjoying the lack of diesel out there, which is brilliant. And also, don't forget, now we can't put red diesel in our diggers and plant equipment because the government want all of our money instead of just some of our money. Anyway, hope you enjoyed watching Otto's Garage. I'll catch you on the next episode. Cheers, guys.